Thank you to Jennifer and our praise team. Well, good morning. Uh, I am so glad to be here before you. I hope you are as glad to be here as I am because I'm ready to have some fun this morning. Although, like we teach our kids, church isn't all about fun. It's not all about entertainment. We may, we may raise them up with fun songs and crafts, and then, and then when they get to, uh, get to the young adult class, when they grow older, and they may ask their Sunday school teacher, why aren't we making any crafts in here? It's like, well... This is the 20-somethings uh, Sunday school. We don't do crafts in here. And that's kind of my, uh, my focus today is, is you see the question up there on the screen. Now, <clears throat> real quick, don't be offended by this question. I am not asking you this question, or if I am, I'm not asking you with any kind of attitude or tone or any presuppositions of what you may think. In fact, I'm asking you to ask this question to yourself. You see how I did that? I took the pressure off me and put it back on your ourselves, right? Right, we're, hope we're doing some personal accountability today, uh, so to speak. So what is church to you really? And the reason I ask that is because, one, I think it's important for us as Christians. I really believe it's important for us to, to know why we believe what we believe, to know why we do what we do. That, that church, that, that Bible study, that um, our church service, that uh, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's home groups, whatever it is, it's, it doesn't just turn into a routine or a tradition, but that there's reason behind why we do what we do. And I'll give you an example of, of my thought process. So my wife and I, we have two children. When our oldest, Isaac, he was three years old, we moved to a new church, okay? So the church that Isaac grew up in, they had the nursery, they had kids' church, they had golf carts that you actually, when you parked in the parking lot, you could get on a golf cart and drive it up to the front of the church. So between uh, when Isaac is age zero to age three, his whole idea of church, he is pumped about going to church. But he's pumped about going to church because he gets to ride in the backseat of the golf cart looking backwards. Have you ever... Have you ever ridden in the back seat of a golf cart going, I guess you're going forward, back, it feels like you're going backwards, you know what I'm saying, right? You're facing backwards, but the driver's forward, you better hold on because you don't know where you're going, it's like, a, it's like a roller coaster back there. So for the first three years of his life, he absolutely loved church because of that golf cart. And then we moved to a church that didn't have golf carts, sadly for him. That was his first question, where's the golf carts, Daddy? Well, we don't have any. Oh, okay. Um, we, they didn't, this church, this new church we went to, didn't have a children's ministry. It was a very small church, so there no children's ministry, no nursery, which means as parents, we have a three-year-old who's been used to act, acting and having fun and singing songs and jumping around in, in, uh, in his nursery and children's church. Now this three-year-old has to sit still? What? And be quiet? What? Mom and dad, what are y'all talking about? we got to sit still and be quiet. This isn't church. Y'all are joking, right? When, when, we're, when we're parents, we, when our children are, are sitting in church with us, we want them to be quiet because we don't want to cause a distraction, right? And, and we feel that pressure. We don't, we don't want anyone to miss what's being said. But what we noticed with Isaac, so we would, um, we, we had books for him to bring. We had coloring books and picture books. We had little, uh, Melissa was great at getting these really quiet crafts that he could open up in baggies and, and do, do things with. And then as he got older and he got a little hungrier, uh, we would bring some snacks, you know. And so what we're trying to do is create an environment here on the pew where Isaac was comfortable and quiet and not a distraction because our whole goal was for our three-year-old and four-year-old and five-year-old as, as he grew to be quiet. But then that three, four, five-year-old, now he's six years old or seven years old or eight years old. Now, now he, He's 11 now. And, and we took a step back and we said, okay, we're kind of teaching our kid to ignore the pastor in church as long as he's quiet. Right now, we weren't really teaching him to ignore the pastor, but what we were doing is teaching him to be quiet. And we had to, we had to kind of adjust our, our teaching methods. As he grew up, as he uh, learned to read better, as he learned to write better, we, we got him a, a Bible and a notebook, and he could follow along with the uh, passage. He could start writing notes um, in his notebook and, and be more interactive. So it's not just about sitting there and 
uh, having art time uh, in church. But we had to adjust, kind of, we had to not adjust what we were thinking for our son, but we had to help Isaac learn what church was all about. And, and we had those, we started having those conversations. Why do we go to church? We're going to church to learn. We're going to church to, to listen so that we can learn. We're going to church to learn so that we can do, so we can grow. We're going to church to encourage each other. So I, I guess if you need a goal for the message, and I'm a goal kind of person, if you want a goal for what we're talking about today, it is that we can step out of whatever, whatever I don't want to call it a rut, but whatever, um, sometimes we get bogged down in schedules, right? Um, sometimes we're just looking for the next one, looking for the next one, uh, whether it's a church calendar, a school calendar, uh, our personal calendar, whatever it is. Uh, if we could just step out of that for a second and just kind of open our eyes, open our hearts, maybe reevaluate why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so I want to share this with you, uh, short and sweet and to the point. We learn it, we, what we learn from Scripture, what we learn from God, the reason we open our Bibles, the reason we go to Sunday school, the reason we participate in Bible study, personal Bible study and corporate Bible study, we learn it to live it, to share it, to grow it. We learn it. We learn God's teaching. We learn God's plan for us so that we can live it out. So it doesn't just stay in our heads, but that it changes our lives, just like the song that we sang this morning that God is a God of change. God is a God of transformation. He changes our lives. We learn it to live it so that when, while living it, we can share it. We can share the gospel. We can share the good news of Christ. We can share whatever we learned today or last week or last month. We share it by the way we live and act and interact with people around us. And then we grow it. We're growing the kingdom of God. When, when the gospel is present in our lives. When people see the salvation of Jesus through our words or through our actions, we have the ability, we have the God-given ability to grow the kingdom of God. So I want to take you to the book of Titus. So if you have Bibles, if you have your phones, if you have a Bible app on your phone, get it out, open it up. I'm not going to think that you're on your phone doing something, so feel free to get your phones out or your tablet, whatever you got. We're going to be looking in Titus chapter 3. Titus is an interesting book of the Bible, and it's interesting because it's a letter, uh, Paul wrote this letter to his friend Titus, who was like a fellow missionary, and, but, but it's different in the sense that this is, more, this is one of Paul's more personal letters, uh, not necessarily to the church as a whole, but to a specific person. Now, we don't know, we, uh, Titus doesn't give us any instructions about if Paul uh, wanted Titus to read the entire letter to every church that he went to. Because Paul does, has, Paul does have a few harsh words. And what it looks like for the people living in the area where Titus was serving, it was an island off of Greece called Crete, and these people, these Christians, seem to be Christians in name only, but not by their actions. In other words, these Christians were like me when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. These Christians said they were Christians, they believed in God, they believed in Jesus, yet the transformation of their lives wasn't apparent yet. And if I can just share a little bit of my testimony there is, I can remember when I was a young Christian, I grew up in church, I was saved at an early age, I believed that Jesus was my Savior, that He uh, died on the cross for my sins, that he, His righteousness was given to me through the Holy Spirit, that God raised Him to life, that He is not in the grave, He is alive today. I believe that. But as a young Christian... It took me a while to understand that everything I was learning on Sundays or Wednesdays or Bible studies, that, that God wanted to use that, not only during that time, but He wanted to use that to transform my life outside of the church walls or outside of the Bible study or outside of Sunday school or wherever it was. You see... When I read Titus chapter 1, verse 16, and we're going to look in chapter 3 real quick, but just to let you know, Titus chapter 1, verse 16, Paul is encouraging 
um, Titus to help these people live out their faith, help these Christians live out their faith. And, and this is what Paul, this is the way Paul explains how they're living right now. He says, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. It's like, how, how can you live in that way? They, they claim to know God. They say the right things with their words. They call themselves a Christian or they claim to have faith in God. They say, I have faith in Jesus Christ. But Paul says, by their actions, they deny him. And, and that was, that you could say that for a part of my life when I was younger, that that's, that's a description of, of where I was. And I can remember a youth pastor one, one Wednesday he, uh, God used that, this message that he gave this youth pastor in my life in a monumental way. And the youth pastor said something like, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be sitting on the fence. As Christians, we shouldn't be sitting on the fence. We shouldn't want the best of both worlds, is what he said. We shouldn't want salvation, and we shouldn't want to enjoy sin. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be um, lukewarm Christians. And that really opened my eyes because up until that point, it's like, yeah, I knew how to act at church. I knew church was good for me. I knew that God's word was good for me. I knew that there was wisdom and understanding. I knew that there were life lessons in scripture, but it's like I left those life lessons inside the church walls when I left. For some reason, up until this point in my life, it hadn't changed me. It's like, it's like walking out of the doors of the church was some kind of transportation device where I never actually really was in church. I, I mean, maybe you understand what I'm saying. I guess, I guess this is how God works in most of us. Because when we come to faith in Christ, I have not met a Christian yet who is instantly perfect. But God promises us that he will work in us to perfection. We are promised that God will never stop working in us. So today's encouragement is to trust that God is working in us. Today's encouragement is to to trust God's word, to trust that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. So without any more waiting, let's turn to Titus chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 8. Paul says, once we too were foolish and disobedient. This is a picture of of Paul and uh, all the Christian people that Paul are working with, all the missionaries that Paul has been working with, the disciples, the apostles. He's giving them, he's giving us, he's giving Titus a picture. Remember, we were all sinners before Jesus. Okay, so Paul's Paul's not claiming that he has always been perfect. Remember, we too once were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and we became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. We, we became slaves to sin. In other translations, Paul says, our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. Now, it sounds like a very drastic picture, but it's a picture of a life without Jesus, which is what makes verse 4 so wonderful. Verse 4, but... When God, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. I I read that verse and I think of, uh, I think of Psalm 23 that Pastor Brian just finished preaching. He restores my soul. He refreshes my soul. He leads me in his righteous ways because before Christ Our lives are ruled by sin and evil. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness to us, verse 5, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. God saved us, not because of our goodness. God saved us, not because we did enough good things. God saved us, not because we are a nice person or we did more right than wrong or we came to church often. God saved us not because of the good stuff we had done, but he saved us because of his mercy. Because God in his wisdom and his love and his grace decided, I will show mercy on my creation and I will give them a way back to me. And that way is Jesus. Verse 6, 
Oh, excuse me. Uh, continuing in verse 5. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And you see, Paul keeps, I mean, I don't know about you, it kind of sounds like Paul is going in a cycle. He keeps, he, he'll take a few steps and he goes back to Jesus. He takes a few steps and he goes back to Jesus. And, and as someone who's trying to get through five, six verses of Scripture, you're like, wow, Paul, you keep going, you're going in a circle. You're taking a step forward and two steps back. The good news is the steps back that he's going to remind us is it's all about Jesus. It's not about the good stuff we think we do. It's all about Jesus. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 7, because of his grace, he made us right in his sight. And he gives us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. I love that verse. I love those words in this verse. Paul's Paul's telling Titus, he's like, listen, you can share this message with other people, okay? You can, you have my stamp of approval. You can copy and paste this in your next email, Titus, and send it out, right? You can tag this and find a great picture and put it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media you do, Titus. You can share these words. I give you my permission, Titus. This isn't plagiarism, I give you my permission, Titus, you can share these words because these words are trustworthy. I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are excellent and beneficial for everyone. The one thing I would like to go back to before our next slide, verse 5, again he says, he saved because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. Church, there's not, there's not some kind of giant scale weighing our good versus bad. Church, we could never do enough good to remove all of our bad. The only way our sin is washed clean. The only way we are made right with God is through faith in Jesus. So the last thing I want to pull from this scripture, Paul said this in verse 8. He says, all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing what is good. And this verse was monumental in my Christian maturity. And I know we're all in different places in our lives. And, and God is going, God is working in us in different ways. And, and our lives, none, we're, there, there isn't such a thing as a cookie cutter Christian, uh, Christian life. We're all going to have different struggles. We're all going to have different triumphs. We're all going to have different lessons that meet us at different parts of our lives. So I don't know where you are in your Christian walk. But if I can encourage you, if I can continue to let God encourage me through this scripture, is that all of us who trust God, we will vote ourselves to doing what is good, to, to doing God's good works. And again, like I said, Paul sometimes repeats himself. And that's okay, because what he's repeating himself about is really, really good stuff. You see, just uh, a couple of chapters earlier in Titus, Paul says almost the exact same thing, but using different words. He shares the gospel, reminding us that it's through Jesus that we have salvation. But then if you go back to another, um, another letter of Paul's in, in Ephesians chapter 2, he says something very, very similar. It's not by works. It's through faith. But Paul is consistent on this one thing. That we have salvation through faith. But in our faith, when we live out our faith, when we are walking in faith, when we are choosing to live in faith, we will be doing God's good works. We're, we're not doing anything to earn salvation because we have salvation in faith. But now the good things we do, that is like the biggest thank you to God. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for loving me enough to save me. Thank you for wiping away my sin. Thank you for giving me the strength 
to fight temptation. Thank you for breaking those chains of sin in my life. Thank you for giving me the boldness and the courage to live for you, God. So we live a life of thanks. Here, uh, again, we talked about earlier, we live it, uh, excuse me, we learn it to live it, to share it, to grow it. Well, here's the Christian life in a nutshell. And I know there's a lot of nutshells. Have you ever counted all the nutshells you've learned in your life? I, I got baskets of nutshells from all the nutshells I've learned. So here's another one for you, okay? Christian life. Doing made, is made possible by knowing. But knowing for the purpose of doing. You see, I, I lived a long time thinking it was one or the other. If I know enough, I'm good. But it's not just about knowing enough. Or if I do enough, I'm good. It's not just about doing, but they're connected. Our faith, in other words, you can think about it like this. Our faith is putting our beliefs into actions. Because how dreadful did I, did I feel when God convicted me and I realized that, yes, my words, I was proclaiming Jesus as my Savior, but my actions were denying Him. And that convicted me in such a powerful way. I realized this isn't how Scripture, this isn't how God wants me to be. Instead, I give my life completely to Christ. I give it all to Christ. I'm not holding back secrets. I'm not holding back anything. I don't want control, God. Take it all. Christian life is doing made possible by knowing and knowing for the purpose of doing good. Peter says in his second letter, He says, everything you and I need to live a godly life is found in knowing about God, is found here in Scripture. The next slide we have up here is a picture. Are you a visual learner? I'm kind of a visual learner. So all all the visual learners in the room, including myself, here you go. My life in Christ, the Christian life in a nutshell, is knowledge of God uh, produces in us a life or living for God. And as we live for God, that's leading us back into knowing God. And so it's, it's this cycle of knowing and doing and doing and knowing not one without the other, not claiming to have faith but looking nothing like it, not trying to earn salvation while never trusting in Jesus, but the two are connected. Knowledge of God produces living for God, produces knowledge of God, produces living for God. If we're not growing in Christ, if we're not devoted to doing what is good, I think we're slipping back into what Paul said in Titus chapter 1 that we're claiming to know him, but our actions are denying him. Our prayer for today is that wherever we are in our Christian walk, that our actions, our lives, do not reflect someone who's denying Christ, but that our actions, our lives, reflect someone who is devoted to Christ. Peter says in that same uh, letter he sent, his second letter, Peter says, The people that say they put their faith in Jesus, but that aren't growing in faith, he says they've they've kind of forgotten what Jesus died for. If him and Paul had a conversation, it might go something like that. Yeah, those people, they're just kind of, uh, they're, they're all talk, they're not living it out. And Peter might say, yeah, that's like they've forgotten what Jesus did, what he died for. As uncomfortable as that idea makes us, to think that I, to, to, and again, this is some self-accountability. What areas of my life, God, show me in my life where I may be acting like I'm denying you as my Savior. As uncomfortable as that idea makes us feel, I think it's a question that each of us need to ask ourselves. And the question is, what am I doing with Jesus? What am I doing with this new life that he has given me? In our our youth on Wednesdays, we've been going through the uh, fruit of the Spirit, and we've been looking at uh, living a new creation life, that in Jesus, he has made us new. We are this new creation, so what are we doing with it? God's given given us this blessing of life. What are we doing with it? He's given us this treasure. What are we doing with it? 
So I know, like I've said before, we're all in different stages of our, of our walk. But no matter where we are, the constant is Christ. And that we are here, even today, learning God's good message for us, God's truth for us. We're learning it so that we can live it. So that it's not some kind of teleportation where we walk out these doors and we're in a different land and we've never even been here before. But we walk wherever we are learning, we are leaving with a new knowledge, leaving with a new purpose, a new understanding of our purpose. We're thankful to God. We, we tell Him thank you. We sing thankfulness to Him. Being thankful to God is an important way that we communicate with Him. But living out our thankfulness is the way that we glorify Him. I would say that living out our thankfulness to God, living out our thankfulness to Jesus for what He has given us, that is our faith, that we are living what we believe. That is how we glorify God. We're not just listening for the sake of listening, but we're listening for the sake of learning, and we're learning for the sake of doing, and we're doing for the sake of sharing and growing. So I want to echo Paul's words one more time as I close, that the gospel is trustworthy, that there's nothing more, there, there's nothing more trustworthy we will ever come in contact with than the good news of Jesus, that he died for us and was raised to new life. But God's given us the opportunity to put our faith in Christ and, and to choose to live a life devoted to God's good works. So I'll close with this scripture. Um, We've been dipping our toe. I don't know if you've noticed or not. We've been kind of dipping our toe in the swimming pool of uh, our Christian purpose. Uh, as a staff, we're going to start uh, reading The Purpose Driven Life again. I think all of us have read it. We're going to read it again. And as I was opening the book and going to chapter 1 and reading, looking at some of my notes that I wrote, because it's been about 12 or 15 years since I've read it. The first, uh, the first scripture in chapter 1 says this, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I loved it. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty eight. this is from the message, says, A life devoted to things is a dead life. It's a stump. Stump. It's a word that if you say it enough, it starts sounding funny, but it's just a dead. It's gone. It may, some of the roots may produce mushrooms on the, on the ground. If you ever go to your backyard, you see those mushrooms. But a stump's a dead tree. A life devoted to things is a dead life. It's a stump. But a God-shaped life, a life devoted to God, is a flourishing tree. Church, I pray that, you're, that, that in your heart you can remember Pastor Brian's words about being renewed and restored by the grace of God when he was preaching from Psalm 23. We're praying that you, you take full hold of that new life in Christ that God has given all of us. And that we are devoted to doing His good works. That, that when we spend time with God, we are soaking up the lesson. We're soaking up His knowledge so that we can learn it, so that we can live it, so that we can grow, so that we can share, so that we can increase the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, as we are meeting with you today, we are praying and asking that you are meeting with us, that you are, you are working in us right now, God, that you are working to effect change in whatever way you know we need it. God, we come before you, we lay everything before you, asking for your grace and your mercy. God, give us boldness where we need boldness. Give us the courage where we need the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the strength to live a life devoted to you. Give us excitement to praise you with our lives. God, give us excitement 
to reach the lost. They give us excitement to witness to those who don't yet know Jesus. In the same way that we praise you for the salvation you have given us, Lord, give us opportunity to share your gospel with the lost so that they too can come to salvation in Jesus. Father God, we need you. We need you every moment of every day. We need you on the best days and the hardest days, God. Help us to worship you with our lives. Help us to honor you with every choice that we make. It's in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.